Well, I have the unique privilege of introducing to you uh, our very special guest, guest preacher and speaker here. He was preaching last night and last hour, and I'm thrilled for you to hear from him. He's a dear friend. And I could tell you that he is a world-renowned C.S. Lewis scholar, but we don't have time, so I won't tell you that. I could tell you that he's uh, a published author and a remarkable intellect, but there's not time, so I won't tell you about that. I could tell you that he's a professor, one of the most influential professors at Wheaton College in their history, which is, but there's not time for that, so I won't tell you that either. But what I will tell you is this, that uh, I love Jesus, not just C.S. Lewis, but I love Jesus more deeply and fully because of the influence of Jerry Root on my life. So would you please give a Chapel Street welcome to Dr. Jerry Root. (laughs) (laughs) The difference between us is when I lift Jeff up, I grunt and groan. When he lifts me up, he shakes me like a rag doll. Of course, he doesn't have time to tell you some things about me, but I have a moment to tell you. I actually once saw him pick up a house on a mission trip, and it's true. The other thing, too, is uh, the, my three favorite preachers in the world, Earl Palmer, John Ortberg, and Jeff Frazier. I, I have to say two other things before I read the text this morning. Um, I I believe everybody matters, everybody. And everybody is wired by God for strategic purposes in his program. But once in a while you meet people and you think, "I, I don't really deserve to even have the opportunity to breathe the air in the same space as this person. There's a person in our midst this morning, you've never heard of him, and yet he's turning his world upside down in Uganda. And he was trying to do ministry there, and, and a witch doctor came up and said, I'm going to put a curse on you, and you're going to die tonight. And he said, no, God is more powerful than anything you can do. And that night, that witch doctor died, and everybody in the church started coming out to find out about the powerful God. And this guy's training pastors and turning upside down his world in Uganda. He's here. I just want to introduce him to you. Robert, stand up for just a second. He's courageous, he's bold, and in his wake, there's a great life change occurring. Um, I hold him up as a case in point, because I believe in one way or another, every one of you can be like Robert. And it may be to one degree or another, Jesus said, some will bear fruit 30-fold, some uh, some 60, some 100-fold. But everybody has the opportunity to make a difference in this world for Christ. And I want to focus our attention on that. But even before I read the scripture, I said two things. I promised Pastor Jeff that I would give a Lewis quote because otherwise I shouldn't probably be in this pulpit, right? (laughs) So Lewis, my favorite quote of his, three weeks before he died, he got a letter from an American girl. Um, If he wouldn't have answered it, no big deal. It's one one of the last things he penned before he died. A little girl in America, 11 years old, here's Lewis on the threshold of eternity, and what advice would he give her? And he said, if you continue to love Jesus, nothing much will go wrong with you, and I pray you may always do so. So with the idea that we are infused with the love of God, and with the idea that maybe we could do something that would approximate the kind of work Robert's doing in Uganda, or your pastor is doing here, or the kind of work God is franchising you to do wherever he has planted you. Let's turn our attention to the text this morning. It comes from Philemon, one verse, verse 6. It's from this particular reading. It's from the NIV 1984. I've translated the verse myself. I think this is the best translation in the English language, my opinion. I pray that you will be active, sharing your faith, so that you'll have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ Jesus. The phrase full understanding is one word in the Greek, epigonosko. It's the most intimate word for knowledge in the Greek language. There's a level of intimacy we'll miss out on if we're not sharing our faith. And whatever the fabric, the complex fabric of your Christian life is, I hope after today there will be a thread woven in that will lead to greater intimacy along these lines. Let's pray. 
Gracious Heavenly Father, I worship you for the privilege of being in this place. I worship you for the long friendship that I've been able to have with Jeff. I worship you for the privilege of being able to pray for him and his family every day. I worship you for the joy of seeing the kind of work that he's able to do in this community. I worship you the fact that Robert is here from Uganda. I worship you for the fact that you're doing great work in this world, and I worship you that each of these people have been called to do great work for your kingdom purposes. But I recognize, Father, that it's ludicrous to think that one man can stand in front of a room full of people and in any way hope to connect with the complex issues that are going on in each heart. Some are here with great joys. Some are here with great sorrows. Some are here with great challenges. What can one person say that can make a difference in all those places? I feel like I'm offering crumbs to these people. But one time, Andrew brought not much more than crumbs to your son, five loaves and two fish. And even though there were over 5,000 that needed to be fed, he took it and he blessed it and he broke it and he multiplied it and everyone left satisfied. Would you please today, in our midst, do something like that? That every person this morning would have the affirmation that he or she is deeply loved by you because each one would have heard in the midst of the crumbs that are offered something that was specifically earmarked for them, that spoke to their heart, that spoke to the context where they live their life each day. And I ask this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Paul actually said, if we share our faith, we'll grow. How is that so? I'm sure we could think of thousands of ways. I'd like to look at three. Um, the first way I want to set in context, I grew up in South Central Los Angeles in kind of a rough part of L.A. I, I didn't hear the gospel there, though I went to church every Sunday because I refused to uh, put up a fuss against my mom. She was a force to be reckoned with. So I went to church, but I never heard the gospel there. I was told if I went to a movie and Jesus came back when I was in the theater, I'd go straight to hell. I wanted to see Walt Disney's The Shaggy Dog, but didn't know if it was worth risking my eternal destiny to go see. <laughs> and when the neighbor lady, Mrs. Greenlee, came down and asked my mom if my brothers and I could go with her boys, Mike and Fred, to see this movie, The Shaggy Dog, I'm looking at my mother with great ambivalence. I want to go on one hand, scared stiff on the other. And when my mother said it would be okay, I began to wonder if she really loved me that she'd put my life in such <laughs> eternal peril. I grew up believing that if I could lose what I had with God by what I did, I would have to gain what I would have with God by what I did, and I never understood the cross in that equation. My older brother was a Christian, and when I went to college, he invited me to a Campus Crusade for Christ meeting. And it was the first time I ever heard the great good news that the God of the universe, all-knowing, who knows every little contour of my heart, that great God loves me and loves me unconditionally. His love is not improved by my well-doing, nor is it diminished by my poor doing. It's a constant. I don't know a person who's lived a moment of honest life who doesn't long to be loved by that, and I was moved by that. Not only that, this person said that night that the God of the universe who knows how messed up we are forgives us. I don't know a person who's lived an honest life who's unaware that they're messed up. We can say we believe in the high ideal of love, but there are times we have sharp words with the people we say we love most in the world. We can say we believe in justice, but sometimes we misjudge circumstances because of our finitude and maybe self-interest, and we do things that are not right, and we know it. And who wouldn't be moved if they've lived honest life? with this great message that the God of the universe who loves us also forgives us. And then lastly, to hear that he would be willing to enter into our lives as Lord and begin to bring order out of the chaos we've made of things. When I heard that message for the first time, I was so moved, I responded, and I have never, ever stopped being grateful for what God's done for me. And in light of that, I thought everybody else would want to know as well. So I started sharing my faith in Christ. And as I would share my faith, 
people started asking me questions. The first way you're going to grow if you share your faith, people will ask you questions. I had no clue about these questions. Matter of fact, I hate to confess to you, I had never before I became a Christian even asked the question, if God's good and all-powerful, why does evil exist in the universe? I've since written a book on that. It's an intriguing question. I think we can get a sure word about it, even if we can't get a last word. But the first time I ever heard that question was when I was sharing my faith, and somebody asked me that question. Oh, my heavens. I said to the person, I have no clue. I don't think we have to let these kinds of questions be conversation stoppers. Matter of fact, we can go back to that person and say, you really matter to me because I believe you really matter to God. And I took seriously your question, and I dug until I found what I think is a substantive answer. And you matter, I want to share with you. In other words, the conversation can continue to go on. It underscores the fact, too, I think, that we, we, we are really are pea brains. The Widener Library at Harvard has 19 million volumes under that one roof. Who's read all those? There's always stuff we could find out. If you don't have any questions about your faith or any doubts at all, I think you're delusional because you think you've achieved omniscience. Don't be afraid of the questions. I, I finished my Bible for the 47th time this summer, reading it all the way through. Besides that, I, I, I'm finishing up 33rd time I've read just the New Testament without the whole thing. Every time I read it, I see something in it, and I go, where was that last time I was reading this? Do you discover new things every time you read? I do. And sometimes I see things, and they don't make any sense to me at all. And, and I put them in the pending tray like a scientist would. I go on. Two or three reads later, I see the answer to that thing, and I go, wow, I'm glad I didn't bail too soon. I would have missed out on this glorious answer I've just discovered here. We're pea brains. God's big. People ask questions. We dig for the answers, and we start to grow. C.S. Lewis said, if our religion is objective, then we must never avert our eyes from those elements in it which seem puzzling or repellent, for it's precisely in the puzzling or repellent where we begin to learn what we do not yet know and need desperately to know. So this, again, is for Pastor Jeff. So Lucy, the most spiritually sensitive of all the children who goes into Narnia, shows up in Prince Caspian for her second trip into Narnia, and she encounters the Christ figure, Aslan, the lion. And she exclaims when she sees him, Aslan, you're bigger. And he says, oh, no, child, I am not. But every year you grow, you'll find me bigger. If you share your faith, people will ask you questions. You'll dig for answers, and you'll start growing. It's amazing. Second, you share your faith, and people will scrutinize your life. They want to know if how you're living matches what you're sharing. And th this gets a little spooky, I think. Socrates said the unexamined life is not worth living. I'd suggest to you, if you're not examining your life, other people will feel the obligation to do it for you. <laughs> I remember when I was a sophomore in college, I prayed, Lord, discipline me. Oh, Lord, discipline me. The next three months that followed were the worst months of my life. All my friends felt it was their obligation to come and tell me all the places where I was messed up. I have never prayed that prayer since. <laughs> I pray instead, Lord, keep me from a hard heart, keep me from a stiff neck, and help me to learn vicariously through the mistakes of others so I won't have to go through them myself. I knew a man once, and he said, you know, I, I would never put a Christian bumper sticker on my car. If I did, I'd have to drive better. <laughs> if you share your faith with other people, they're going to check out your life, and they want to know if it's for real. I remember when I was in college as a freshman, a new believer, this church I started going to, there was a man who was an electrician who worked at my college. When I'd see him on campus, it was like an oasis in that kind of wild world. But you know what? He had an edge on him. And sometimes the guys at his work would make fun of him because he is a Christian, and they would badger him and push him a little bit. And he didn't respond well. Matter of fact, one day at work, he Colcox, one of the guys he worked with, and that was the end of his job. He was gone. And his opportunity to be a testimony in that world was evaporated. I watched that. That next summer, I, I had to earn my own way through college. We were poor. And so I, I got a job working pipeline construction in Los Angeles with a jackhammer. I could make enough money in those days to pay my year's tuition, this job. But it was hard, hard work. 
130 pound jackhammer running down to the next hole, digging the hole, doing the next thing. It was just tough. As soon as I got there, all these guys found out that I was a Christian and they were on me like flies to stink. And they were, they were badgering me constantly. And I remembered what I'd seen that other guy do. He didn't respond well. And I just, I just kept my mouth shut. I worked hard. And not only that, when they said stuff, making humor at my expense, it was kind of funny, so I laughed. And after two weeks, they saw, hey, he's one of us. And they accepted me. And I was able to witness to them throughout the summer. I remember the last day, uh, before I got ready for my last day at work, before I had to go back to uh, college, I said to them, what would I need to do to share Jesus with you? They said, Jerry, you bring us a case of beer and you can talk to us as long as you want. <laughs> well, I didn't know if that was legitimate or not. I didn't know if I should do that, and I wasn't old enough to, to do it, but I thought, okay. So I brought this case of beer. They divided it all up. Each one just put one can in the cooler, and when the day was over, they each popped their can of beer, laid out on the grass, and said, Jerry, you can talk to us about Jesus as long as you want. But it meant that you had to kind of lean into the abuse and the hostility, not let it knock you off your guard, because you're there for a reason, a unique reason. And you just love on those people and pray for them, and, and it goes better. People will scrutinize your life. They want to know if you're the real thing. As a matter of fact, a lot of times we'll see people, and they, they don't like God. And when you try to find out what the big issue is, it's usually not an intellectual issue. It's usually because they were hurt by somebody who claimed to be a Christian. Have you ever run into that before? What do you do when that happens? What I've been trying to do lately is I, I'll say to the person, tell me that story. It sounds sad to me. And they'll share some abuse that they experienced at the hands of a Christian. And I'll say, I'm sorry you endured that. It makes me have a broken heart. But I'm a Christian. Will you allow me to stand as a surrogate in place of that person who hurt you and ask your forgiveness? Because I wouldn't want anything to keep you from seeing how deeply you're loved by God. So if, 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 if these things happen, we can grow because we can learn the shortcomings in our life and maybe even in our community, and we can get better and be more authentic as we share the gospel. Third way we'll grow is that we'll see God showing up. Actually, we'll start showing up in where he's already working. Jesus said the fields were widened to harvest. When he said the fields were widened to harvest, that's how I know people out there want to know. I have never found it easier to share Jesus with people than right now. The reason why is because our secular society completely squashes the spiritual interest. I think Augustine says our hearts are restless till they find their rest in thee. You don't find in the secular society people opening these conversations up, and yet people are restless in their heart, pines for some resolution or looking for some object to the longings of their heart. And I found if you can begin a conversation sensitively, people want to talk about these things. They're real about us. I'll talk about that in just a moment. But nevertheless, we start going out and we start seeing Jesus show up. I don't think we take Jesus to anybody. He's already there, more in love with these people than you and I will ever be. I had a friend years ago, he started a church, and he grew that church from a Bible study in his living room to a church of over 1,000. And he had a man in his church who was on his board, and he said this man was an engineer, started a business. He knew he had started a business. He was a wise man, and he, he was also a, a good systems man, understood how things worked. And one day this man at his church said, I want you to come see my business, and afterwards we'll go to lunch, and we'll talk about church business. My pastor friend said when he showed up at this guy's plant, he couldn't believe it. He knew he started from scratch. There were over 500 workers at that place. And he saw the genius of this man in his workplace. And not only that, as they walked through the plant, he couldn't believe his heart. He'd say, hey, George, how are you? Weren't you in that bowling league championship last night? How'd that go? Did you guys win? Hey, Sylvia, it's great to have you back after your maternity leave. We missed you. Did you bring pictures of the baby? Do you need some more time off? He said, I knew this guy for years at church, but I never really got to know him until I got to know him in his workplace. You can know God for years at church. But if you really want to get to know him, you need to get to know him in his workplace. So how does it work practically? We'll grow because people ask questions. We'll grow people scrutinize our lives. We'll grow because we see God show up in our world. There could be, a, if there's three reasons, there could be 3,003. 
But just with that, let's move to some practical things, okay? And as we move to those practical things, I have to tell you, I do not have the gift of evangelism. I have it as a high value. And what I've learned, I've mostly learned either by Scripture or by making mistakes and trying to learn from those mistakes. Every athlete who plays sports, certainly football, right? We would look at films after the game, and we would evaluate how we did so we could get better at the next game. And I think as Christians, we need to look at our game films once in a while. If we make some mistakes, and let's grow from those. Don't, don't shut down. It won't always go well. But if you're afraid of playing baseball because uh, you might strike out, well, then don't play baseball, but then you'll also never know the joy of hitting a home run. And we grow from these things, and we find that God's at work, and he wants to use us. So what are some practical ways we can do this? Number one, I think you should pray for people in your world. You can pray for Aunt Gertrude in Freeport, Maine. That's okay. But I'm talking about people in your immediate world, the people you see with some degree of regularity. Uh, when I first became a Christian, the pastor of the church I attended said, Jerry, if God answered every prayer you prayed this last week, would there be anybody new in the kingdom? I realized if I wasn't praying for people, I'd probably be missing out on all kinds of things that percolate into conversations. But when I started praying for people, I started seeing things happen. Take 10 people in your world, your immediate world. Not all of us will be Apostle Paul's, but none of us is less strategically placed than him. It's just that God has put you in a particular environment, surrounded you with people he wants to love through you to himself. It's really wonderful, actually. So pray for people. And then on occasion, tell them. Uh, I, I, I pray for people and, and maybe every three weeks. I might see them a dozen times over three. I'll tell them, I pray for you every day. That's as aggressive as I get sometimes. And then, and then maybe uh, three weeks later, I'll tell them, I pray for you every day. And I have just out of that, I, by, by the way, I've never said to somebody, I pray for you every day and had them say back to me, well, would you stop it? <laughs> Most people are moved somebody's praying for them. But a lot of times what happens is you, you pray for a person and finally something unravels in their life. Who do they want to go to to talk about it? And I have seen people just with no more, no more intention than telling them I'm praying for them. I've seen them come and want to talk and I've been able to lead them to Christ. It just starts there. Anybody can do that, I believe. Um, I think secondly, not only do we pray for people, but learn to ask public questions to engage people. It, does, it doesn't always work to just jump in and start talking about Jesus. I, I don't think you can, some, uh, sometimes you might want to do that. That's okay. Jesus did it with the woman at the well. He did it with Nicodemus. You must be born again. That's pretty explicit. But I think probably an easier way is the gentler way. Ask public questions and listen to the answers. What's your name? If you're in a particular town or city, are you from here? They are there. That's a public question. Listen to the answer. One time I was um, uh, giving some C.S. Lewis lectures over spring break in Slovakia, in Bratislava. Uh, if Forrest Gump was here, he'd say, that's a whole other place. And, and, and when it was done, the people that I was giving the lectures for dropped me off at the Vienna airports about 45 minutes from Bratislava. And... and uh, I get checked in, I go through passport control, I'm in the uh, 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 waiting room, and, and I find out the flight's delayed three hours. I love the anonymity of airports. I pulled out a book, I started reading. It wasn't long after that, I saw this young woman walk into the waiting area, and she had a, a, a lanyard with a name tag, she had a clipboard, and she was walking up to people, and she was speaking to them in German, it's a German-speaking town, and she's writing down things on the clipboard, I think she's doing a survey for the airport. Sure enough, she came up to me in a moment, and she spoke to me in flawless English. And I'm thinking, what am I wearing that she knew that I, I should be spoken to in English? I felt a little insecure at that moment. She told me she was doing a survey for the airport, and I said to her, what's your name? Public question. She said, Allegra. I said, Allegra, are you from Vienna? Public question, listen, no, I'm from southern Austria. With the information, she gives you permission to ask more deeply. What brought you to Vienna? I'm a student. Now, where can you go with that? Where do you go to school? What are you studying? And it opened up whole lines of conversation. I said, do you have other family members in the south of Austria? And she said, she said, she did. She had a father there, but he was a very bitter man. 
And I said, oh, why was he so bitter? Well, my mother left with her lover to go to Canada, but she had every good reason to leave. He's such a toxic person. I said, wow, sounds like there's some estrangement there. Do you have other family? A brother, he's uh, also at the University of Virginia. Vienna, but we don't get along very well. I said, man, that's sad. You've got a lot of brokenness in your life. She says, it's worse than that. I said, tell me. She said, my boyfriend left six months ago to study art in Florence, and he said he'd be back in six months, and I should wait for him. I waited dutifully. He came back yesterday to tell me he met somebody better in Vienna. I mean, excuse me, in Florence. I know how to touch this woman. I know what parts of the gospel will be relevant to her. But I got there just by asking public questions and let her take me to the place. So finally, after 20 minutes, she hasn't asked me a question for her survey yet. I said, after 20 minutes, you know what, Allegra? I've been sent here to tell you something. Then she thought I was a plant at the airport to see if she was doing her job. I said, no, it's not like that at all. I, I have been sent to tell you something, as each of you have been sent. She goes through her questions, how long it take to check in, get through passport control, and so on. And then she said, what were you sent here to tell me? I said, Allegra, the God of the universe knows you, and he loves you. Allegra, he will not abandon you. Allegra, he loves you. Sometimes you have to say it three times for it to sink in, and the third time I said to her, Allegra, he loves you. She just burst into loud sobs. Everybody in that waiting area started looking over at me as if I was torturing this poor girl or something like that. I said... She said, but I've done so many bad things with my life. And I said, the reason why Jesus died and rose again was to forgive you of all of those things. It wasn't that hard. So anyway, ask public questions and see where they go. Listen and follow up because they give you permission. People are all around us, all around us who want to know. I remember one time I was sitting at home. It was a Friday, and I was off on Fridays then, and the garbage guy pulls up. I had prayed earlier that morning, or there are people on your radar screen that aren't on mine. Garbage guy pulls up. I go, I don't even have to look for this guy. He comes to my house every week. I wrote down on my prayer list, garbage guy. <laughs> he came by about 10 o'clock every Friday morning, so the next Friday, it was a hot part of the year, I had a glass of iced tea all ready for him. When I heard the truck pull up, I went running out there with the iced tea, and it was back in the days when they had the basket in the back, and they'd come around the back, and they'd throw the garbage truck, and this guy comes around the back. I'm already standing there, and he kind of goes like this. Who, you know, what's up? I said, you look like you could use a break here. You drink the tea, I'll throw the trash. Well, he's looking at me. I'm throwing the trash, and I can see him going, who's this? Is this okay? <laughs> he takes a little safety sip. It seems to be okay. I said, what's your name? He said, Mike. He has a name, people. His name was Mike. I erased garbage guy and put Mike on my list. Every week I was out there with something warm to drink in the hot part, or cold part of the year, and something hot to, or cold to drink in the warm part of the year. Uh, one day he came by about noon, and I said, Mike, you're a little late on your route today. He said, yeah, I have problems on the route. I said, it was about lunchtime. Did you eat lunch yet? He said, no. I said, well, can I make you a sandwich? He said, yeah. And he came in and, and had a sandwich with me. I didn't know those guys could do that. <laughs> you know what else had happened? He changed his route and came by at noon every week after that. <laughs> And every week I was making him a sandwich and we were talking and you know what, his story, he started to unfold his story. And you know what it was? There was a neighbor lady when he was a little boy who loved on the kids in that neighborhood and she had a backyard Bible club. And he remembered praying the prayer when he was a little boy. And then two weeks later, his family moved away and nobody ever followed him up. I got him a Bible. We started going through follow-up stuff. It wasn't long after that, he and his wife started going to church and his wife and his two little girls came to faith. And then he got traded off the route, and I had a new guy, Mick. And I was able to share with Mick, too. And then my mail guy, I don't know who, do you know the name of your mailman? You should know him. My guy right now is Phil. Every time he comes by, if I'm home, I go, hey, Phil, do you need to use a restroom? I mean, I don't know what those guys do when they're on their route. <laughs> Jesus said a cup of cold water sometimes would be helpful. Just human acts of kindness. Sometimes if it's really cold out, he'll say, could you make me a cup of coffee? Sometimes it's really hot. He says, can I get a Coke? <clears throat> and I'm having conversations with Phil now. There was a mailman before him named Steve, and I was able to lead Steve to Jesus. It took time. 
but it was just constantly loving and praying for him over a period of time. Steve came to faith. I said, Steve, you ought to come to church with us. He said, you know, Jerry, I'm divorced, and I have the kids on the weekends. The only time I get them, and I just think it would be too difficult. I said, bring your kids. Our church has great stuff for kids. They're going to love it. And come for dinner afterwards. And Steve came with his kids. And I remember after dinner, I was able to get on my knees next to him and see both of his boys come to Jesus. And it was so much fun. And then there's Mark who's the guy who works behind the counter at Walgreens by my house. He's one of the guys I'm praying for right now. And I'm in the stage right now with him where every time I see him, I say, Mark, it's so good to see you. You know, I pray for you every day. And the conversations are starting to get more and more flush as we go through this. People all around, I think. As a matter of fact, sometimes if, if you're faithful at doing this, God will drop people unexpectedly in your life because he likes to bring people who he's reaching into the lives of people who are willing to reach. And I remember I was reading a paper at a theology conference just a little while back, and, and, and I, I come in and I sit on the plane on my flight home. I sit by the window, and this guy comes in, and he sits in the middle seat, and he says, rats, I got a middle seat. If I'd have really been a spiritual person, I said, oh, here, take mine, but I didn't do that. And then a guy comes and sits by the aisle. And he says, Professor Root. I said, you got the drop on me. I don't know if I've ever met you before. He says, I was at your paper at the theology conference. So he and I start talking theology, and we got the guy in the middle seat. <laughs> and I said, what's your name? He said, Sean. I said, Sean, forgive me. We don't mean to talk over you. We were just both at a theology conference. Please feel free to be a part of this conversation. After about two minutes, I turned to Sean, and I said, Sean, are you a spiritual person? He said, I am. I went and studied with a shaman once in Peru. If you hear something like that, don't be turned off by it. God says he won't put out the smoking flax, and any kind of spiritual interest is something you can work with. I said, Sean, tell me that story. He said, I saw that I could study with the shaman. I saved up my money. I saved up my three weeks of vacation time, and I went down to Peru to study with this guy. I said, Sean, how did that go for you? He said, it was the worst money I ever spent in my life. <laughs> and then he said, what's in it for you, Jerry? And I explained the gospel briefly. The God of the universe loves us unconditionally. And anybody who's lived an honest life knows they're messed up. He forgives us. And he's willing to enter into our life as Lord and bring order out of the chaos he said, that's the most comforting thing I've ever heard in my life. I said, Sean, is there any reason why you wouldn't want to trust Christ right now? He said, none. And that night, right there on the plane, he prayed out loud with me to trust Christ. The guy who was sitting on the aisle, he was a Ph.D. student at Trinity Seminary in apologetics. He's used to putting up scaffolding. He's not used to obstetrics. <laughs> and he sees this guy born again right in front of him. And he's going nuts. And you know what he did? He turned on Sean and loved him up the rest of the flight back, helping him get started in his new faith. He, Sean lived in Toronto, so we were able to send him some stuff to at least start follow-up. But you want to do follow-up whenever you can. You know where one of the best places is to lead somebody to Jesus? Right here in church. Matter of fact, last night after the evening service, there was a man who happened to be there, a man that I had prayed for off and on for years. He was the grandfather of one of my son's football buddies and roommates and he hadn't come to faith and he happened to be at church last night and I was able to share with him about Jesus and he gave his heart to Jesus last night church is a great place to lead people to Jesus and you, you, you know there, there are people that will come in on a, if you were given seating assignments for where you were to sit every Sunday every one of you would rebel but look at you, you sit in the same place every Sunday anyway. <laughs> what if you became a pastor of your pew? If you became a person who says, you know what, I'm going to own where I sit, and anytime I see somebody I don't recognize, I'm going to go up to them and meet them. Years ago, I was a pastor out in California in a place called Santa Barbara. If you believe in Jesus, when you die, you go to Santa Barbara. It's a beautiful place. <laughs> And I would always, after service, go up, and if I didn't know somebody, I'd just say, you know, I'm sorry, I don't think we've ever met. Are you new here? And sometimes they'd say, well, I've actually been going here for 30 years. I'd go, well, maybe it's time that we meet. But usually I would get it right. And one Sunday there was a guy sitting down there, and I walked up to him. I said, what's your name, sir? You look new to me. He says, my name's Robert. I said, I don't think I've ever seen you before. He says, I've never been here. I came today. I said, what brought you here, Robert? He said, I'm a student at University of California, Santa Barbara. 
And my girlfriend broke up with me this last week, and my heart is just ripped to shreds. And I thought maybe if I went to church, I could find something. He could have walked in and walked out, and nobody would have talked with him. I said, Robert, do you mind if I tell you what's at the heart of the Bible, the message at the heart of the Bible? He said, no. And I shared the gospel with him, and he trusted Christ. You know what I do with people who trust Christ? I try to start follow-up with them. Because God wants us to grow, and he wants us to grow, because if we can come to the place where we're sharing Christ, we'll grow. I want to get him to that place. So I always take him to John 6, 47, first thing. And it says there, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. Did you just believe? Yes. What do you have? Eternal life. John 6, 47. So then I take him to John 17, 3, and I tell him, it's not just forever. It's forever with quality. It's a relationship with God in Christ. I take him to John 17, 3, where Jesus has said, and this is eternal life, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And then I take him to Matthew 13, the parable of the sower. You know, the sower went out to sow. Some seed fell on the side of the road, got trampled underground. Some seed fell on the rocky soil, and it sprung up and then died out. And some of it fell among the weeds, and it got choked out. And then some of it fell on good soil, and it bore fruit 30, 60, 100-fold. And I say to them, after I share that parable, which soil would you like to be? I've never had anybody say to me, I'd like to shoot for the weedy one. <laughs> you know, mediocrity, I'm all about mediocrity. No, they always say they want to be the fruitful one. I say, so do I. How about if we start getting together and trying to grow together? And then we set up the appointments. We start off by talking about Jesus and the love of Jesus. We learn to fall in love with him. Fall in love with him with a heart that is so inclined towards him that if our world falls about over here, falls apart over here, it's not going to destroy us because that's not where our first affection has been. It's been on him. And then we start talking about being in the word, growing by being in scripture. And then we talk about prayer and a conversation with God and confession. The Greek word for confession means to say the same thing. I think when we confess our sins, we're growing towards self-awareness before the God who loves us. And then we start talking about being in fellowship, not just being in a worship service, that's important. But I'm talking about that kind of fellowship where we lay down the masks and the pretense and we get real with one another. And then we start talking about giving. Why do we do that? Because God wants us to develop a magnanimity rather than hoarding self-interest. And then finally, we get to the place, by, by the way, we do giving not because God needs the money. He's fine, actually. He's going to be okay. But we need to cultivate magnanimity. And then I take him out sharing. And so Robert and I went out to the campus of UCSB to share Jesus with people. And, and, and what I did, I said, I'll talk to the first one. You watch. Second one, I'll initiate the conversation and bring you in. Third one, you initiate the conversation. I'm here to back you up. I wish I could say millions of people came to Jesus, and I know you all read about it in the newspapers and stuff. Nothing happened. No fireworks. Nobody came to faith at all. But Robert found out it wasn't so hard. So that next week, I get a phone call from him. Hey, Jerry, I'm talking to my roommate, Paul. He's got some questions. Could I bring him to your office? He brings him up to the office. We answer the questions in a way that was substantive and sufficient for Paul's need at that moment. And I said, Paul, is there any reason why you wouldn't want to trust Christ right now? He said, none. And I could have just jumped in and prayed with him, but I would have missed out on an opportunity. I said, Robert, why don't you pray with your friend? He prayed with, Robert, with Paul, and then he started follow up with Paul. And they started sharing Christ with people. Six months later, Robert said, I'm leaving Santa Barbara. I'm going to move down to San Diego because my folks live down there. And they don't know Jesus, and my friends don't know Jesus, and I want to move there where I can share Jesus with them. And he left my life. And I left Santa Barbara and moved to Chicago to teach at Wheaton College. Several years passed. And I was invited back to uh, California to speak at Talbot Seminary, the graduate school at Biola University, and do a week of meetings with the grad students there. First thing I was supposed to do was have breakfast with a bunch of seminarians. It was supposed to be at a restaurant called Mimi's. I don't know if any of you have ever been to Southern California. Mimi's is a restaurant that looks like somebody went in and shot it with a foo-foo gun, you know? And, and so we're supposed to meet there for breakfast, and I'm pulling into the parking lot, and who's pulling in right next to me? I go, Robert, how 
how coincidental is this? I moved to Chicago, you moved to San Diego, and here we are both pulling into parking spots right here at this restaurant in La Mirada. What a coincidence. He says, it's no coincidence. I'm here to have breakfast with you. I said, no, 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 Robert, I'm having breakfast with a bunch of seminarians. Wow. Wow. Is it fun or what? There are people in your world who want to know. If you share with them, Paul says, your faith will grow into deeper intimacy with him because you'll be part of what he's doing in the world. And I think there are some things you can know about him in no other way than that. And I think it's cool. Let's pray. Father, I worship you for the privilege of encouraging these people deeply loved by you these people who had somebody in their life somewhere along the line who talked with them about you, and they came to faith in you. I pray that you would open up their eyes to the fields that are wet into harvest. And I pray, Father, too, this, that everybody within the sound of my voice this day, that within the next year, they would each one see at least one person come to know you. And I pray that in the process, they would not only be able to extend your love to that individual, but sense your love for each one of them as they grow in faith by sharing their faith. And we ask this in Christ's name, amen.